Hello there, Takumbo. Welcome to the Well-Centered Woman Podcast. I am so happy for you to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so excited to be on your platform. I love what you're doing. I watch you on social media. We have seen uh, your work when you came to the Purpose Party. So I'm excited to be here and I am blessed for the opportunity to be able to share on your platform. Awesome. Well, I am blessed for you to be here. She is Takumbo, the leader, you guys. And by the time you're listening to this, you would have heard my introduction. But this lady, coach, speaker, author, entrepreneur, not only that, she's a pastor, pastor of Legacy O, and she's just a, bit, a creative. Of the most, one of the most creative and passionate people I have seen. We're talking about Write Your Book Academy, the Entrepreneur School, Healing Through Writing Workbook, Prophetic Scribe Activation, all of these projects, webinars, many things that she has produced over time. Just a prolific producer of various guides and challenges. And, you know, by the way, like I said, she's a pastor. And as we get into this interview, we're going to unpack what it means to lead as a woman of God, as a woman of influence. But before we go, I want to get a little background on you because, you know, your brand, your business, you have the name Tokumbo the Leader. You chose that for a reason, right? And it, it sounds like to me, based on that, that there's a story behind that. You're a natural born leader. So it must have started really, really early. So I would like for you to share with our listeners your leadership journey from your earliest days. How did you pick that name? All right. So I picked the name originally because I was fielding different names for my business. And some people were like, yeah, just go with that name. At first I thought like it sounded like kind of arrogant or it sounded like, you know, that I like, I didn't want to sound like a know-it-all because, you know, leadership is about humility, but it was signifying to me and it was signifying to the people that actually voted on the name that I was a person that was passionate, that I am a person that's passionate about leadership and about helping other people to lead and to be intentional about their leadership growth and development. And so the name was chosen because I am literally obsessed with leadership principles. I did not realize this until I became older, how obsessed I was. But even since I was in the 10th grade, I've been taking leadership courses. And so just, I guess, a little funny story is that we had a leadership class in the high school that I went to and I was class president the year before. So my guidance counselor, she overrode something to get me into the leadership course because the leadership course was actually only for 11th graders and 12th graders. But she was like, yeah, I'm going to put you in the class. And so I had to like, even this past year, I had to backtrack, like how in the world did I get obsessed with this? And so like, that was like my first entryway to understanding that leadership, you can be a born leader. And yes, I am a born leader. Like I've, I've, I've accepted that that's in my DNA. That's how God created me, but you can be a born leader, but there's also things that you need to do to study, to grow your gift, because a lot of us are, uh, are born leaders, but the extent that God can use us is by way of us being intentional about our leadership education. Mm -hmm. And so I get in the 10th grade, she, she makes me do the leadership class and I stay in that class all through high school. I was in in 11th grade and in 12th grade and then I get to college and then I do another leadership course and again I'm the, the youngest person in the whole cohort it was some leadership program that was uh, unique to this particular professor and I was the only I think I was a sophomore that year so I guess God was doing something with those second years in school and everyone else was older than me either a senior or they were a junior and so I was the only sophomore in that class and then as I got older I was like you know I really need to study more about leadership so then I have another degree a master's from Columbia in leadership as well so that is something that I just had to just own and not think like you know think about what other people are going to think about the name but it really was my heart is to make sure that people understand that if you are called by God to be a leader it is your responsibility mm -hmm. to do the to go in your journey and do the education or get education so that you can grow in the gift that God has given you. So I hope that answers your question mm -hmm. and gives you some background and clarity as to why my business is called Takuma the Leader. Amen. Amen. I love that. How you decided, okay, I'm called to be a leader and I'm going to choose to, to be intentional about really deepening and developing that through education. And so you were very intentional, very, very intentional about really developing that. And like I mentioned to you before we got on this Zoom, the Facebook Live video that you did, so I'm going to transition here about 
the dangers of being a mislabeled woman. Now, you guys, if you're not following her on Facebook on Tukumbo the Leader, that T-O-K-U-N-B-O, the leader, find her on Facebook. Find her on Facebook and go through these videos. But in this video, and we're going to unpack this in our, our talk on today, where you segue in what you're saying about educating yourself and developing yourself as a leader. I love this. And one of the points that you brought out, and I'm going to ask you this question about, I love how you said, God made us women, right? And there's something in me, there's something that he put in you, there's something that he put in me like, and he's like, this can only express if I make Tanika a woman. This can only come out if Tokumbo is a woman. This can only come out if Joanne is a woman. And that, and it was very intentional. It couldn't come out in a man. It could only come out in a woman. And this, you know, we're called to operate and our, with our vulnerability, our temperaments, everything that we are as women. And you mentioned in that video that this is something that God had to work with you on. Can you share how he uncovered that itch, issue and what it brought out? And what are you seeing today in the women that you coach and mentor in this area? Yeah, so I love everything that you said about how God is intentional about choosing the gender and choosing how he wants to express himself in the earth realm through, I mean, Every single thing about us is intentional, right? Your skin color, even your hair, your hair texture, how you choose to wear your hair. There's a way that God has designed you for the audience that you're called to and what you carry. And so there's a femininity, there is, there's nurturing, there's certain wisdom that women have that God wants to express in the earth realm uh, through through that certain vessel. And so I know I told a story on there on that live for those of us that have not watched it, but one of the things that I struggled with was understanding that the different nuances on how God can use women and it doesn't have to just be in one area because I feel like I feel like especially in the church we they put a cap on what women can do in certain denominations or certain streams whatever have you there's a cap and you can only go so far or you can only go here and when I started like becoming way more serious about my relationship with God I was reading scriptures and I said oh yeah women cannot be pastors and Da, 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 da. That was like the schema that I was ingrained in because that's what people were teaching me. And so the funny LOL of this whole matter is that God sent me to a church where the leader was a woman and there was another leader on the team as a prophetess. And I was like, I mean, I don't understand it. But when I went, like I actually was like driven to that church, like I had to go to the church and I met her and I, I, I told people this, I tell people this story all the time that I was like, I wasn't trying to join the church, but all of a sudden I was talking to her and my mouth opened and I said, I want to join the church today. And I was like, why did I just say that? And I was like, that's weird. I was like, I didn't really mean to say that because <laughs> they didn't even do an altar call or anything that day. And she was like, yeah, I meant to do one today to see if anyone wanted to join. I have a meeting with her and she lets me know why it's biblical for her to be a pastor, even though she didn't have to do all that. But she lets me know why it's biblical because I, I was in my, with my bold self, um, I, with my uncouth self, I came in the room and I was like, look, I mean, I'll join the church, but I really don't believe women are supposed to be pastors. Like I'm really struggling with that wow. uh, while I'm sitting up here signing up for this church. And she was explaining to me uh, why she was eligible <laughs> wow. to, to be used by God <laughs> in this way. But I also feel like even in the church, you know, they let you become evangelists or they let you do certain things or they won't let you do other things. And it's like, huh? Uh, this, is, this is interesting to me, but I feel like, I mean, God had to break that early so that I could be able to be confident in being a female leader and not having to be like anyone else. And that's another thing too. If you feel like, oh, I have to be more masculine or I have to do like, I have to do this, like the, like the men do, or like this person does, then you're going to lose the potency or you're going to lose you, the authority that God has given you because authority comes through authenticity. And so one mm -hmm. of the things that we teach women and all the coaching programs that we have at To Come With The Leader LLC is that you have to discover what it is that God has given you. And you have to be so confident in that because in that is where you are going to change lives. In that is where you are going to make the most impact. And so I don't want to be like this other person. I don't want to be like this, even if it's another woman, I don't want to be like the other woman. I want to be myself because God, even beyond gender, you just have to be yourself. Jesus died so that we can live as the authentic version of ourselves. When we put that weight on the fact that he died so that we can be able to live authentically, then I feel like we're going to take our calling a little bit more seriously. And so that is something that is part of my message or part of my coaching is that we have to get to 
our our real selves. We have to strip away all the things that, you know, and you talk about this too, right? All the things that trauma and all the things that pain has caused us to be this counterfeit version and God's desire through healing and God's desire through the blood of Christ is that we work, we do the inner healing, we do the work to become the authentic versions of ourselves. That is what he's been fighting for. And that's why we were able to, uh, that's why we were able to get cut off from Satan and his devices is because God wanted us to be the authentic versions of ourselves. I love that you guys hear that. She's been dropped the mic the whole time. We just got started. We just got started. I love what you just said. Authority comes with authenticity. Authority comes with authenticity, not with me trying to be a copycat, not with me comparing myself to every other woman on Facebook and Instagram and everybody else is doing lives, not me trying to be a man and huff and puff and hoop and holler and be whatever. Authority comes through authenticity. And that led, you just segue yourself right into my next question because you said God had to break off this whole, like me, women can't be a pastor. We're, you know, all of that stuff had to be broken off, which leads into what else you talked about when we talk about the dangers of being a mislabeled woman, the, the old lies and labels, how taking that off, you know, so that this, this whole counterfeit false version of myself that's been packed on me by all of these lies, all of these vain imaginations, all of this stuff, it has to be stripped. And so you talked about how God had to take you through a process of where you, be, you discovered the little lies and the little things that were distorting your authenticity, to, so to speak. And it had, you had a false version of Takumbo, but not the real authentic one. So can you speak to what this process is like? Because there's somebody who's going to see this and they may be in it and don't know how have language for it. Right. And what advice would you would you give to someone who's in this place? OK, I'm in this. You use this term, you say deep dive introspection, and I like that. How how can they navigate this whole, like I'm unpacking these layers and lies and false narratives and I feel I'm tripping and tribulating. How do I handle that? Yeah, so because I get this question a lot and because I meet a lot of leaders that go mm -hmm. through this, I wrote a book called The Seven A's, uh, excuse me, Healing Through Writing, which goes through the seven A's of healing. And then I also wrote How to Dominate in Your Destiny, which goes through the seven A's on how to dominate in your destiny. Because these are the this is the work that I did on my own for like 10 years, really, of doing that deep dive analysis, that deep introspective work, that self-reflective work to be able to listen to the Holy Spirit and begin to strip off the things that have made me the, the counterfeit version of myself, right? And so one of the things that we tell people is that healing is not magical. Healing is not something that's overnight. Healing is a process. It's a journey with the Holy Spirit. But you have to make the intentional decision that you want to be the real version of yourself. You want to be the whole version of yourself. And so number one, you have to become aware that you have a problem. I tell my disciples this all the time. I'm like, my mentees, this, you need to know that you have a problem. And until you come to that sobriety, because all of us have the problems that sometimes, you know, that pride or, you know, our family members may have never told us or our family members, they let us get away with, you know, throwing these tantrums and doing all these things. And so you never realize that you have a problem. Maybe your friends were enabling you, but you have to sit with yourself and you have to, there's some questions that I ask people in the Healing Through Writing book, but you have to sit with yourself and say, hey, I actually have a problem and I need to get help. And this is an emergency. Because if you know that God is calling you to something higher, he's not going to allow you to go as a broken version of yourself. And so you have to have a certain level of urgency on you to say, hey, I need to get healed. And so that's number one. And so when you know that you need to get healed, the number two, you have to have sobriety that this is, this is not going to be an overnight process and that you have to partner with the Holy Spirit. And he's also going to bring people in your life to help you through your journey. And so I was fortunate enough to have my pastor disciple me when I was younger. And she had to tell me, you have a problem. You have a problem. And <laughs> like, appreciate your leadership gift. You're not about to lead nothing right now because you're accounting, you are broken and you have issues. And some of us, we don't like that type of mentorship. We want everyone to, you know, platform us. We want people to give us the positions. And I thank God for my people because they didn't let me do nothing. I was like, I tell people this story all the time. I was like, I'm gifted. I'm going to be like doing all these things. They about to put me on this. They didn't put me on not one thing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or I, I was on something, but like I had to be partnered with someone else, but God, uh, even like <laughs> going back through that process, God had to show me like, Hey, you are, I am not going to 
push you out of obscurity until you deal with all of these things because you know people talk about this all the time but i don't understand why we don't we're not getting this in our minds that just because you get platformed is if you're if you don't handle your stuff in the dark or while you're in obscurity once you get platformed those things are going to show up in your character mm -hmm. it's going to show up in how you deal with people how you do with your money how you do with all sorts of things and so the next you know the part of the, your journey is that you need to understand that it's a journey and that there are certain things that god is going to you know begin to break off of you that you're going to be frustrated because you're like oh man i'm called to these things i'm called to be a creative i'm called to celebrities i'm called to entertain i'm called to all these things but you have made a conscious decision that until God lets me out of this season, until God says it's your whole, that I don't even want it. And so that's where all of us have to come to that place. If we are a person that is a future responsible global influencer by Christ, then we have to go into a place of understanding that, hey, I'm going to stay in my process mm -hmm. until God lets me mm -hmm. out of this process. And Amen. the number one thing that a lot of people do with your gift itself is that you prematurely abdicate the process. And that's say why you're again. not- <laughs> you prematurely abdicate the process and that that not only hinders you, but that also hurts, hurts the people that you're called to lead. Because at the end of the day, one of my mantras is that, you know, built people, build people. And so it's not only when you get internally built and when you are, you know, when you are healed and you're a whole, you really create programs and you create systems and structures so that you can build other people. We're not here to build buildings. You know, buildings are nice. That's great. That's awesome. But we're here because God wants us to change lives. He wants us to change families. He wants us to change generations. And that is something you can't do that as a broken counterfeit version of yourself. Come and on he, now. And if he's not going to be able to get the glory out of it, then then you don't need to partner with him and he's not going to, he's then you don't get yeah. all the stuff that comes with your whole process. You don't get the angel armies backing you up. You don't get, <laughs> you don't get the favor. You don't get all these things. You don't get that ease to do your purpose. If you want to do it outside of the context of God. And so I said a lot here, but stay in your process. Stay <laughs> in your process. And I heard hey. another person say, a broken woman will build a broken business. A broken woman will build a broken business or ministry, right? You, you, you said a whole entire mouthful. You said so much. And the thing about it is, if we abdicate our process, if we jump out of it prematurely, you know, God is using that and he's pruning this stuff out of it so that we don't make our platform an idol. We don't make all of the pomp and circumstance and all of the extra an idol because if I'm unhealed and if I'm broken, I'm going to put, I'm chasing something. I'm striving in my flesh to have something, right? That's what happens when we're not fully healed and when we're not fully processed. And I love the term that you use, sobriety. Sobriety. I need to be sober to realize Look, sister, chick, you got issues, dude, girl, you know, you, you got some stuff. You need to deal with that. And that that requires humility. So I like how you broke that down. And you you mentioned that you actually talked about this in this mislabeled woman because you talked about you. You talked about if my identity, this is something that you said, you said my identity has to be solid in him, because if it's not when I get when when I get to my platform, I'm going to be wavery. I'm going to kowtow. I'm going to capitulate to the demands and I'm going to morph and change because my identity is not solid because I didn't go through my process and I wasn't sober. Come on. You mentioned that. Dive into that a little bit more. And then I need to, <laughs> there's another question I want to ask, but that whole thing about kowtowing and capitulating because you're, you 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 can't be platformed in destiny because you're too, too, too volatile. Share on that a little bit. Yeah, before I share on that, I want to encourage people that if you are in a season of obscurity, one of the number one things you need to be doing is definitely analyzing if you see yourself as a daughter of God, because mm -hmm. that's going to be the place that you're going to produce the most fruit, right? And so one of the biggest things that God had to take me through for even like two years was the understanding of sonship or being a daughter, understanding that he's my father, because once you do, once you are immersed in that ideology you are a person that when you know certain contracts that, that don't that are not biblical or certain things that even even if it's not biblical that's another thing some of y'all be go past that because there's some of us that's like okay yeah we know it's not biblical why would i be spending money on like why would i do a video like that that doesn't even make any sense but for some of us it'll be it'll sound good but it's not what god told you to do 
And so that's why it's so important to understand your identity in Christ and to understand how he speaks to you while you are in obscurity and understanding the concept of obedience. And so I think I talked about too, like one of the major things that God wanted to do with the children of Israel in Deuteronomy, right? The repeated law was that he was enforcing, Moses kept enforcing the law. He kept repeating the law over and over again. He kept saying this concept, you know, be holy because I'm holy. Leviticus 19 too, he kept repeating the law. He kept telling them, hey, you need to worship and serve God only because once you get to these places, these people, they serve different gods. These people, they have... They, they're they're wicked. On. They actually sacrifice their children to the God of Molech. Like, like they are doing wicked activity. And matter of fact, that's really one of the reasons why I'm adhering to the promise. Not because you did anything that great. And so he was saying, and I, you know, I kept asking, I said, man, he, but Moses is repeating the same thing. He done said this in Exodus. 49 Levin. times. I'm like, this is a lot. And God's like, it has to be a lot because it has to be part of your DNA because your old nature would be able to capitulate to things that God didn't ask you to do. Your old nature will, you know, come out of character and do things that God didn't ask you to do. But once it becomes part of your DNA and once it, be, it becomes part of your system, you start to, you, st you will only take in things that God told you to take in. You will only partner with people and do so activities because God says because at the end of the day you know contracts mm. partnerships all is that is beautiful great but if it's not what God told you to do that's not beautiful because you know a lot of us what I measure success someone asked me this in another interview she said you know what is your definition of success I said my definition of success is that when God tells me to do something I just do what he told me to do and so a lot of us are chasing after things and you know you're getting exhausted or you're you're angry sometimes because God didn't God didn't really ask you to do that um yeah. And so when you get to the gates, I hope I'm answering your question because I'm saying a lot you here, but are. when you, when you get to the gates, this is how I live my life. Anyways, when I get to Jesus, he going to ask me, did you do this, 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 right? Well, right. When, when, so when Samuel came, I think it was Sam, yeah, when Samuel came to Saul, he asked him, did you do what God told you to do? That, that the question was, did you do what I asked you to do? And so that is why it's so important that we have to be people that are immersed in what, you know, what God's voice is. Like he was trying to train them on what, what do I sound like? What's my nature? And that's what you learn while you're in obscurity. That's what you learn when you are intentional about your healing is that you learn God's voice. That's what you're supposed to be doing anyways, is you learn, I love his, that. learn I love how he speaks it. to you. You learn his nature, you learn his heart so that you can be able to disseminate to the people, uh, disseminate that to the people that you're called to lead as well. When we go through the process, we get the DNA of our father in us. And we only get that when we sit in the process long enough. Get that DNA in. I love what you are saying. And we're going to transition here because another thing that you talked about that is so important, it's just really, really critical that I loved how you talked about it. You made this one quote, the biggest thing that keeps us from execution mode is lack of confidence. The biggest thing is, and you you said that we 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 it's it's the lack we can't execute because we don't really really have the confidence in who we are. And so I wanted to know what is the key thing in your journey that has built up your confidence. And you know there are leaders that are stuck in procrastination and distraction. You know, this this ongoing, they're driven in distraction and procrastination and they don't know how to execute. Can you share on that? And how has God, you're in your journey with God in terms of this whole confidence piece and executing because you execute at a very high level, very consistently, and you're constantly, how do you do that? And tell me about that confidence. <laughs> yes, a lot there. Confidence is like <laughs> a huge thing that I realized that is hindering people from, you know, stepping into their purpose. That's why we created how to dominate in your destiny, because once you understand what you are called to dominate in, and you know that God has called you in this area. So one of the things that has helped me was understanding my purpose and understanding my destiny inside of God, understanding my gifts. How has he wired me? So this is why I'm confident. And like, what have I studied before? So those are the things, right? Mm -hmm. How has God wired you? What's your gifting? Do you have the education and expertise behind it? Did, did you have, do you have hours behind working on your craft? Because one of the reasons why I'm confident in most of the things that I do is because number one, that's because God told me that's 
what I'm supposed to be doing. So number one, we need to learn God's voice and learn what he has said about our destiny. How did he wire you? How did he create you? So that's why the prophetic is so necessary. Mm -hmm. When you're going through a deliverance journey, I tell my mentees this all the time, but when you're going through a deliverance journey, one of the things that's going to keep you on that journey is the fact that you understand your destiny because you are going to fight to be free because you know where God is taking you. And so the thing that kept me in the process and I was like, I'm not getting out of this process because God told me I was going to do all these things, but he said, I'm not going to do it if I don't get delivered. So I'm going to stay in this process because I see the destiny. But if you don't have, I love that, it. Mm. Yeah, if you don't have that foresight, you will quit your deliverance journey quickly. So you need to have people in your corner or in, so I, I went to, I always go to prophetic churches. And so I always have people around me and I've, and I heard these things too, or some things are things I've never heard of before. Cause, uh, prophetic prophecy is not only things that you know, but you do have to have some sort of idea where you're going. And so learning God's voice and learning where he's supposed to be, where he's taking you. And then understanding your gifts inside of him. Like he created you, he gave you these particular gifts. And so actually your gift was never for you. And mm -hmm. so if you continue to withhold your gift from people that you're actually doing people a disservice and you're actually being rebellious and disobedient. So that's one of the things that motivates me is that I recognize that my gift was never even meant for me. It was meant to bless people. It was meant to bless generations. So that's another thing that pushes me into execution mode, that this is something that people need. It's of value. And then you also think about your education. If you're a person that spent money on your education, you spend time on your education. Listen to me. <laughs> I have student loans. Y'all not going to stop me from executing. I got, I have to pay student loans. <laughs> come on be now and beyond that i know how many hours i stayed in that classroom i know how many hours i stayed up i know how many hours we was crying trying to finish papers no so i'm not about to let the devil i'm not about to let come on somebody that doesn't know me personally try to try to discount me or discredit me i know my process and i say this all the time to my people my mentors my mentees that you know apostle paul says you know i don't care if i'm your apostle i have the scars of my body so i don't care what you think I know my own process. And that's another thing that, you know, a lot of people, they don't confidently execute or they don't do anything at all because maybe you have to, you have to start to analyze, did you fight in your process? Was it really something that you fought for? Because if it's not something that you fought for, then that's probably why you're lackadaisical about fulfilling the call of God on your life. Because Ooh. many of us, you know, if you actually, you know, you were on the floor crying and asking for deliverance, you was at the altar every time they called you and then now you're free, you're whole. And God says, okay, thank you. We're done with deliverance season. That was great. We're in a building season. I need you to listen to me. And when you understand the process that you went through, oh no, I'm not about to let no one stop me from executing because I already know how many times I went to the altar. I know how many times I didn't ask for prayer. I know how many times, I know how many times my, my family was making fun of me because they think something's wrong with you. I know because I went through the process. I had the scars in my body. And so that is actually what causes me to be convicted to fulfill whatever it is that God told me to do. I know what I went through. So Come on, I, know my, I know my own journey and I know the struggles and the, and the wars and the fights and the, and the learning and the isolation, the loneliness. I know all this, even the psychological things the trauma mm -hmm. so that's the thing that keeps me actually going and actually executing at a high level because i i remember i have a memory i have history with god right that was the, the mm -hmm. theme i have history with god and so i know what i went through with him come on somebody <laughs> so if i had when i look back over my life and all he brought me through and all the hell i went through you're not gonna waste that hell when it's time to execute you're gonna execute because you paid your suffering dues you yes. paid your suffering dues trust and believe i know exactly all, embar being embarrassed feeling stupid being by myself feeling like girl come on somebody i don't sweat it went through all this stuff produced the two books i did went had to go through a dead in relationship divorce marriage all of this stuff and you gonna tell me i'm not gonna write the book and tell the story and set other people free i paid my dues with this yes i know exactly the feeling and so once you're, you know, and, and I like what you said about if, if you're lax, lackadaisical about executing that you must didn't fight. You didn't fight. Your fight, you didn't sweat enough. You didn't pay a price. You didn't suffer mm. enough because the acceleration comes with a price. Platforming comes with a price. It comes with suffering. So maybe, mm. you, didn't, maybe you didn't suffer. Maybe it was just handed to you. God bless you. <laughs> mm, y'all y'all hear this speaking of that now that we're here another thing that you talk about 
This is really good. And we don't like to talk about this. See, somebody's not going to like this, but they need to hear it. What we just said and what you just said, just <laughs> this last five minutes here. But you mentioned, you know, God for us to really ascend and to be platformed into destiny. Our pain to tolerance, our pain threshold has to increase as leaders. I frankly don't like that. <laughs> I don't. I really don't. I'm, I've, I've, paid, I've been through some painful stuff. I'm like, God, you mean to tell me I got to go through more pain, even more? Really? And so I want you to unpack that. Yeah, like how? And you made this comment. You said how you respond to pain is going to be your dif differentiating point as to whether or not you will dominate in your destiny. So can you share any painful moments as, or what that was pivotal in building your pain tolerance? How did you partner with the Holy Spirit? so that you did not quit when you were in pain. Yeah, so I have so many points. Uh, <laughs> uh, which one do I want to share? Holy Spirit, give me one. Uh, so one of the ones that I guess I can share was when I had to actually grieve my father's death. So I had been ignoring it for like maybe like even 15 years. And God was like, this is why it's important to have people around you that are, you know, higher than you, that you're, that you know, yeah, and your peers that are, that can keep you accountable because the person who was discipling me, my pastor, she was like, you know, you have to deal with this because this is affecting you. This is affecting your, your, your work. This is affecting how you show up. And so it was actually painful to unpack those things because you realize that throughout your life, you are putting things over that you are, you know, you're getting, well, for me, I was like getting awards. I was running for leadership positions. And so God like stripped all that away from me and say, okay, you ain't doing none of that. You ain't, you don't have no friends. You don't have no party to go to. You're going to sit right here and you're going to deal with this right now. And so that was a very, wow. those were, that was very painful. And that took like some years too, because I kept trying to get out of the process. That's why I always coach people. I'm like, stay in the process because it, if you, if you, if God's hand is really heavy on your life, he's, he's not going to let you out the process. Just stop, just stop playing with him. Just, just, <laughs> just, just surrender. Just stop I playing. Tried, I just, I tried many times. And so the when I say that you know how you respond to pain that's going to be the differentiating factor because sometimes God allows us to go through things I mean if something you know if someone does something bad to you and it's like you know very heinous and egregious I think that's different right uh, and that speaks to whatever they're going through and maybe even some boundaries that you may need to put in place and so that's a that's a response to pain right do you need to go back and put boundaries up that you didn't have before or are you going to allow this pain to crush you and for you to never bounce back from that painful situation. So even you mentioning that, you know, you had to, you wrote your books after experiencing heartache and heartbreak and divorce. Right. And so definitely taking that, what I tell the people when I coach them through writing is that, you know, you take the pain that you you've had, but you become a more impactful person when you have jewels and wisdom from that. Mm -hmm. So that differentiates people. Cause if you went through a painful experience and you didn't learn anything about yourself, you didn't learn anything about God. That's where, that's where you're going to become stagnant because I believe that God can use every single thing, right? Even if it's not good, Genesis 50, 20, right? Joseph tells his brothers, you know, you, what you meant for evil, God used for the saving of many lives. And so even though the adversary, he's going to use things for evil, but you need to begin to look at God and say, you know, why did this happen to me? Even with my dad dying at a young age, I was like, why did this happen? And when God started to unpackage why it happened and why he allowed it, you know, why he allowed it to happen and what he was going to use it for that's when I actually became confident and that's even how I wrote my first book really to be honest is because I allowed God to give me wisdom and I allowed myself to not just stay in a sunken place and so if we just allow ourselves to stay in that sunken place and we allow ourselves to be labeled by painful experiences that's going to be the detriment to you being able to to use your gifts at optimal capacity you're not your painful experience you're not what has happened to you but what is it that God wants you to be able to teach powerfully and some Sometimes if you're a prophetic scribe, we talk about this, that sometimes you do have to go through certain things because God wants you to write from a place of compassion. And so it's, sometimes it's not even that you did anything wrong. He may want you to experience it, especially if you're not really even doing anything. Like you're not, you're not actively sinning. You're not actively trying to start trouble and something just happens yeah. and you know, God will use it and he will mm. use it for the, for the saving of many lives, for the impacting of many lives. Right. And so that's how I like to look at life. Like what kind of book should I write after this painful experience? What were you trying to teach me God asking powerful questions because I think some of us we don't ask questions we just be like you know what was me and mm. I'm, not, I'm not trying to minimize anyone's pain either but definitely 
healing and asking God, you know, to heal you and definitely walking with him through that journey and using the tools that you have been given. Right. But I don't, I don't, once you go through a very intense inner healing season, I don't believe that you're going to have to keep going through intense, intense inner healing seasons like that. Like some yeah. seasons, are ten, some seasons are 10 years. Cause you have a lot of baggage from your, your childhood, but once wow. you get through all that and you're an adult and you put boundaries in place, you, it should be like, it should be one offs. Like, Maybe someone left your church and they they marred your name and it hurts you. Yes. You know, talk to God about that hurt, but you're not about to sit in pain for like two, three Five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about someone mis, uh, mis, uh, speaking badly about your name, right? And so using those tools that you've learned throughout your intense healing journey to heal quicker and to bounce back quicker so that God can continue to use your life for the saving of many other people's lives. Amen. Amen. Did you guys hear that? The power asking powerful questions in your healing process, it accelerates it and it accelerates your capacity to bounce back stronger, to bounce back more resilient. And I think that resiliency comes from those powerful questions from partnering with the Holy Spirit gives you the resiliency you need to bounce back come when you go through painful situations. And as a leader, why is it that that pain threshold has to be higher. I mean, yeah, because is it because uh, as as opposed to a regular person? Because you're dealing with people, right? And mm -hmm. people are people are finicky. They are messy. Finicky. Yeah. And so you have to be so emotionally stable, not even only resilient. You have to have some emotional intelligence that I mean, Proverbs 1911 is something that you have to live by, right? That you have to overlook transgressions and offenses. You have to be a person that has to overlook those things so that it doesn't slow your productivity down. Because one of the things that I say is that the adversary does not care that you are gifted. He doesn't care that you can do all these things. What he cares about is that you use your gift at optimal capacity. What he cares about is that you're confidently using your gift and you're living like Christ. That's what he cares about. And so I'm going to try to figure out how I can slow down your productivity. I'm going to figure out how I I can how I can cause people to make you feel less than so that you can go sit down somewhere. And so mm, as a so leader, good. You, yeah, as a leader, you have to build that pain tolerance and you have to build that uh, that resiliency because things are just going to happen. Like you may not get that contract. So are you going to just give up? Or are you going to continue to operate in the gift of faith? And also, I personally believe that if you're a leader, that you should have the gift of faith, right? Because you are a person that's supposed to continue to encourage the people that you are called to lead. If you are or leading a larger organization, the gift of faith should be inside of you so that you can continue to believe even when the outside circumstances, the external circumstances are telling you not to believe, but you hold strong to what God said about what he said about your organization. And you have to be the person that continues to push people to continue to contend for whatever it is that God has given you. And that's why you have to have resiliency because things are not gonna come easy to you just because you're the leader. That's not how this works. Things are not gonna be easy for your organization because you're a Christian. That's not how this works. And so God is still going to like, God is still going to uh, grow your gift of faith, even in the midst of that. But you take the resiliency or you take the, you, you take what you learned in past seasons to continue to grow and expand and not to be phased by the adversary. And, mm. you know, and the people are just, been, people are just going to be people. So if you're going to be tossed to and fro by every person that says this and does that, then you, you just not going to mm -mm. be, because people, people are, they're, they're just who they are different regions. They act differently. They, you have to yes. deal with people. You, you can't mean, be getting in your feelings and being all emo it. You cannot be getting in your feelings and taking stuff personal and being easily offended and call yourself that's trying it. to lead something and have some kind of a platform. That's so it. yeah, absolutely. Ooh, this is good. This is good. So we're going right from pain into pressure. Pain into pressure because I know you know about and you talk about that as well like it, how are you going to lead if you can't handle pressure and weight and you you mentioned this like God can't move you into the next part of your destiny if you're not able to handle pressure so what is Takumbo's definition of leadership pressure I mean I want what is pressure we use that you know like this sort of amorphous <laughs> this thing like what is leadership pressure and how does it feel for you and what does it look like in the women leaders you've mentored and how we how do we deal with this yeah so just to answer this because i don't have a definition but just to answer it right now leadership pressure is the things that god uses to prepare you for your next and so if you feel like in this season you can handle every single thing and every single thing is great it's it's manageable you may be in the wrong season because yeah. God is preparing you for the next season. And so the next season, you have there are going to be some things that you you have to rely on the Holy Spirit. So pressure is these are the characteristics that you're under God pressure. 
you have to rely on the Holy Spirit to get through this, to get through this process. You have to rely on, you know, prayer, fasting, whatever it is, so that you can get to the next. And pressure too is something that's, that's supposed to increase your capacity. That's the number one thing that I talk about is that some of us don't have volumes to carry things or we don't have volumes to even carry people. And so your metron of influence and what God is going to be able to give to you on your plate is based on the fact that you allowed him to increase your capacity. Even as a public school teacher, I taught for seven years, right? In low income areas, lots of pressure. And you, when you go, when you feel that type of pressure, one of the ways that you navigate through this, and I hope I'm answering your question because it's a lot but one of the ways that you navigate through this is that you ask the Holy Spirit, what is this season preparing me for? And so you're going to be able to continue to withstand the pressure, withstand the stress because the pressure season comes with stress. And so, you know, you, you know, we like to say, you know, I'm blessed and I'm not stressed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I love those. I'm too blessed I, to be stressed. Oh, right. I love, what, I love what Dr. Daniels says, right, though, because he says that there's good pressure and then, excuse me, there's good stress and then there's bad stress. So good stress is like, you know, you maybe you have more clients. But like, how are you handling that? Are you emotionally intelligent? Do you know how to put systems together in place? Are you working with the Holy Spirit to figure out how I can get these things in place? And so, and you might, you're going to feel overwhelmed, but the whole point is that this is a God sized vision. And so if the vision was so small and if it was so like, oh my gosh, yes, yeah, on me, then you would have the, then you would be able to give yourself glory, right? We all know Gideon's story. If you read your Bible, right? And judges, he taught Gideon, he tell God tells Gideon, there's too many, there's too many of y'all. Nah, I don't need all y'all because I don't want. I don't want Israel to say that they did this themselves. I think he cuts it from 10,000 to 300. I, I don't remember the numbers, but 10,000 to 300, that's a lot. That's a lot of pressure. But here's the thing. You know that you're under pressure and you know that God is going to be able to help you to navigate well and give you the victory. And so you, do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel like it's good stress? Are you able to, to be emotionally intelligent with the good stress that is happening to you. And even if it's bad stress, are you still able to say, God, how can I, what should I do right now so that I don't allow this to, over, to so that I don't allow this to cause me to prematurely leave whatever, whatever it is that you have called me to do? I hope that answers the question. I love that. I love that. I, I was trying to take notes, but that's the beauty of podcasting. Cause like I'm, I'm getting fed, you know, y'all, this is my little low key, key way of getting my own self fed. <laughs> Do you realize what you just said? Have you even articulated it to yourself the way you just said it just now? Has anyone ever asked you to define leadership pressure? You gave five key questions to ask and everything. Have you ever really had that ask? No, I just know what pressure it feels like when God is preparing you for the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the question she said for us to ask is, what season is this preparing me for? Mm -hmm. what season is this preparing me for is this good stress is this bad stress and you you are going to feel overwhelmed if it's a god-sized vision you there should you you have to be able to lean on him because it you're what you're saying is if it's too little and too small and you feel like you got it then it's probably it's probably not a god-sized thing right so good so good you said is there anything else on this on this leadership pressure no. <laughs> well, I wanted to, I just wanted to say that if you do have a lot of increase, I did a, another live about increased responsibilities. And I remember I was asking, I said, just take this things off my plate. And it was funny because he was taking nothing off my plate. And <laughs> wow. Sometimes, sometimes we get into those seasons because God is trying to get you to tighten up certain systems in your life. Sometimes he's trying to get you to tighten up your time management skills. Sometimes he's trying to get you to tighten up, stop being on social media all day, stop being on the phone all day, stop surfing and use the time wisely. I think it's Psalm 90 verse 12. I, I believe that's like, you know, teach us teach to number, us our, number days our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And so sometimes we do have increased responsibility because even where you're going, you are never going to, it's never going to be easy for you because God sees you higher than where you are right now. You may think, oh, well, I'm just a teacher. Like this is nothing, but guys like, no, I see you as a CEO of multiple companies, but in order for you to have the capacity to be able to manage these multiple companies, I need to see what you're doing. I need to put the pressure on you in this season. And so I thank God for, you know, small beginnings. And I thank God for obscurity because that's when you get tested on, can you handle multiple things? For me, it was in teaching, right? We have to do multiple things all the time as a classroom teacher. Like, is it so many different things? And so now as a multiple business owner, as multiple, multiple online schools, I was prepared seven years ago for seven years to do this. So 
you know, and pastor a church. Um, be, by the way, don't forget about <laughs> don't let's not forget what this lady's doing. Like, how in the world? Yeah, like, so those, yeah. Tell me, tell me this. <laughs> yeah, so those are things that you had. To, I had to learn over the seven years, like how to manage my time wisely, how to be a good steward of time, how to be a good steward of the resources that God has given me, and even how to ask for help. Because some of us don't know how to delegate as leaders. I know how to delegate, so my team knows me. I know how to delegate. Uh, I mean, there's some things <laughs> I. There's some things that we sh- we could all get better at, but there's things that. God wants to tighten up in every season. And so even right now, there's certain things that God was like, okay, I need you to tighten up this before I send you to the next level. And some of us, it sounds so simple and we still don't do the simple things. And that's actually hindering you from going to the next. And so now you're some, so sometimes the pressure is unnecessary because you decided not to listen to him when he told you to go prepare your books, go prepare this in this season. And you said, oh, well, I could just keep doing that. Okay, keep keep doing whatever you're doing and not listening. And then when the pressure is even heavier because you didn't listen, that's different, right? Ask yourself, this is bad stress now. This ain't stress from, this is not good stress now because you needed to do what he mm. asked you to do the season before, right? That's what we need to understand our times and seasons. Come on. Ooh, she just dropped the mic. It rolled under the table and across the floor. Cannot. I want you to say it again and you probably forgot what you said. <laughs> But you said something like if I had done what you told me to do in the first season, the simple things, and now I got unnecessary pressure. We have unnecessary pressure because we won't obey us the simplest instruction. You yeah. Know, and I, like, hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. And like, there's things too, that even God will do for me. Like he'll make me do like a high, like a high volume of intense work for like one month or two months. And you're like, oh my gosh, this is so much, but it's so ease out what's going to happen for the rest of the year. And so sometimes we, we forego the invitation of pressure. We forego the invitation of increased capacity because we're like, oh no, that looks like it's going to take up too much time. Case in point, my grad school program, we had to sit in class. It was an accelerated program, right? So if you want to be accelerated and you want to, you have to do uncommon things for the acceleration. You have to make uncommon sacrifices. One of the things that we did, we had to sit in class for like eight to 10 hours. Then we had to go back to our dorm rooms in grad school, right? And then do our papers because we wanted to graduate earlier than a normal program in 16 months. That was acceleration for our Ivy League program. You like we had to do unusual things to be able to finish in 16 months. And so there are certain things that God will have. He'll put pressure on you to do something. And it's only for a season, though. That's the number one thing. It's just a season. And that is where we get tripped up because I could have been like six weeks. I'm not going to be in this. Um, I had to sit like it's summertime. And so the sun, you know, as a teacher, like I was trying to enjoy my summer. Oh, man, I have to take two summers. But guess what? I have my degree. It's over with. It was just a season. And some of us, we forego. And I feel, you know, it's, you know, God is so merciful, but it's just so painful when we forego the things that he was trying to produce out of you because you couldn't handle a season. You thought a season was 20, 40, 50 years. But I was like, look, it was just, it was going to be for two months. And I was a lot of pressure. I know but it's just for a season. And I'm trying to increase your capacity because this is where you are going. And so I knew why he put me in that program. That's why I stayed in the program. I knew what type of pressure he was trying to put on. I knew why the pressure was put on me because I, I, I understood my destiny. And sometimes he won't even reveal all of that to you because we walk by faith and not by sight, right? Second Corinthians 5, 7, I believe. That is an- another thing too. Once you get older in Christ, He's not about to tell you all the details. And that's where a lot of us get tripped up. We want to get all the details. Mm -hmm. Why am I getting all this stress right now? Why am I getting all this pressure? Okay. Keep doing all that. And God will not be able to send you to your next, right? I'm going to stop right there because I could talk about that all day. Y'all, whoever's listening to this, you need to be taking notes when this comes out because we forego what God is trying to do because we can't even withstand the pressure for a minute for a season he's just asking for one hot season just just a season not 20 50 years just a season and we forego the capacity that god is trying to build in us just from this one brief season of intense pressure is going to produce all of these results in our lives all because we submit it to the process of pressure in that season but we forego it and we run from it and then we create greater pressure and bad stress later on down the line when we weren't obedient here in obscurity while we're learning and building our capacity in the short term Mm -hmm. Oh, she's preaching better than (laughs) you. This is powerful. So, so powerful. We're coming up to the top of the hour. And so I just had a couple of questions. So so this is a different one. So 
Let's think about this. If you could go back and give your 18 year old self one piece of advice, what would you say to 18 year old Takumbo? Yeah, the biggest thing I was telling myself is to believe God. Believe mm. God, believe God, believe God, believe God. When I was 18, I had given my life to Christ when I was like 12, but then I, I really did it like for sure when I was 16. And I feel like at 18, I really did not believe God. And I didn't, I wasn't confident in who he made me to be. And I like, I was, I was upset because nobody else in my circle was like trying to live for Jesus like me. And so I just tried to like fit in and then I, I couldn't fit in. And then I was like, I, I don't know. And then now looking back, I'm like, well, believe God and you don't need to fit in. Like, just do your, just be a believer and believe, you know, be, hold fast to whatever it is that God told you to do or whatever he told you to be. I feel like I, I wasted so much time. I mean, it was like mm. two years. I wasted just so much time, but those two years, are, I needed those two years. I wasted, you know, I wasn't able to understand like, what is it, what is it that God wants me to do in college earlier? I didn't even realize God wanted me to teach until my senior year of college. Okay. Because I was so dead set on my own thing. I wanted to do my own. I was like, I have my own plans. And I like, yeah, I was not really like holding mm. on to God and like listening to what it was that he wanted me to do. And so I really wish that I held fast to even being the goody two shoes. Like people were making fun of me like, oh, you're such, why, why are you doing this? Like, why are you, um, I tell this joke goody time, two like, shoes. Yeah. Why are you putting this uh, Bible verse as your, your way message on AIM? If you know what AIM is, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, instant, instant message. Yeah. Yeah. And so I was like, you know, trying to hide that because I wanted to fit in. And it's like, girl, you was never meant to fit in. Go sit down somewhere. And so just believe God, whatever he says to you, like you need to hold fast to that. Whatever your friends say, maybe you need to get rid of those friends earlier. So I really wish that I stayed as a geeky Christian that I was and stayed in that because that's what I was meant to be. I don't care. That's your authentic, <laughs> that was authentically who you were. And so labels and that counterfeit false stuff was trying to show up then at that place. So yep. powerful, so powerful. And my last question, and then we're going to wrap this up. Is there any one thing in the process of being an entrepreneur, all your multiple businesses and products and things that you do that has come up that you just really didn't expect in this journey? Is there any one particular thing in sort of this whole process? I mean, you're a producer, you're a producer, you're a creative producer. Anything in this journey that you really didn't expect to, to see? Everything. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Cause I originally, well, I didn't have a time frame to like when I wanted to do more entrepreneur stuff. I knew that I was called to it. Like it was always on my life. I was president of the Future Business Leaders of America Club in uh, the eleventh grade. So I always knew it was on my life. But I was frustrated because I was like, God, when you going like, when am I gonna get out of this classroom? Um, so like I was like I would put up documents on like how to create writing programs and how to get a publishing company so like I was dreaming in the classroom and so when I started my first online course I was thinking you know I'm gonna run that for the year and just you know just see how that goes and then people were like oh well can you publish my book and I was like what I was gonna do that like years later like I was like yeah I have a timeline like years later I'm gonna do that and people were like no I need you to do it now and so that was like something that was like super shocking. So I had to create my own publishing company. I, and that was like not part of the plan. I was just going to do all that was courses. not part of the plan, God. It was, it was not. And so I had to figure out how do you become a publishing company? Like, how do you help other people to publish their books and, you know, make it make a product that people enjoy, but put, people put that pressure on me. So I, I really but I. I knew it was on my life, but I, but I didn't know the timing. And then even the other courses that came after that, because so I really was, I'm a person, because you said this already, I'm a creative, but as I get older, I know how to control my creativity because that's something that people, we don't understand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> even mm -hmm. pro prophetic people, right? We get a dream, we're like, I'm going to start that next week. And I'm, I'm famous for it. And so... But because I'm getting old, because I get older, I know that like times and seasons. And so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do another, you know, I'll do something else later. And so then another course came out right like after that was a different entity. And I was like, what's happening? Then even I think we're <laughs> on to our we're on to our third course right now. Well, we have a bunch of courses, but like schools, these are actual schools um, that are like weeks long. And I did not know that this is why you have to stay in your process because I already had the capacity to do these things. I had capacity to create curriculum. So it's kind of light work for me because I taught classes. This is another pressure, right? I had to teach classes from in one of my schools, 
I worked at a charter school, which is, I don't even tell you the name of it because everyone knows that this school is like super famous for pressure, but we would be in the classroom from 7 a.m. up until 1 p.m. Then you get a break at 1 p.m. to go do your planning period. And then you have to finish another class until 4 p.m. And then sometimes you have to stay after school. And so I was already like, and so, and we had to write our own material. We had to write our own workbooks. And so some people are like, you know, they look at me like, how can you produce workbooks in one to two days? Because I increased my capacity through seven years. That was seven years of me practicing, making worksheets every day for five days a week. But here's the thing. When I got there, I'm just adding more on here since it's the end. But when I got there the, uh, at that charter school, I was upset at first. I said, I don't have a textbook. I don't have any worksheets, which this is, I said, y'all crazy. And then God was like, you're going to own your own public. I said, no, no, no. I said one day I said to myself, I said, well, I guess God is just teaching me how to make my own textbooks. Cause I'm going to own a textbook company one day. I was just making a joke. And then God was like, no, that's exactly what you're going to do. Like you're going to write your own stuff for your own company. I'm like, okay, whenever that happens. <laughs> and so even with that, I think in the span of two years, I've published five books of my own, uh, five, uh, yeah, materials of my own and all my courses, any class that I teach, I always have a book, even if it's a 90 minute class, a three hour class, excuse me, you came to that three hour class. There was an ebook attached to it. That actually could have been a published book. We're probably going to publish it this year, but every class that I teach, it has to have a book with it. So like all these things, I didn't know I was going to even do them. I just thought, you know, I'm going to run this Write Your Book Academy. It's going to be cool. Like I'm going to do it all year. I'm going to just keep re-enrolling, re-enrolling. God's like, yeah. Anyways, next class. Okay. Next class. Okay. And also publishing company and people are signing up. So I was like, okay, well, I guess this is God because I didn't know I could do this. And then also too, having to ha ask for help. And so it's not only me that's doing this because I, I can't, I can't do this by myself. You can't do so it by yourself. Not, mm. I hope that answers the question. It did. That what, what about your business that you did not expect? And what I'm hearing is you didn't expect to be doing a publishing company. You only had one idea. The next thing you know, you got like 10, 15, 14 different things going on. I mean, you've written a lot of stuff. I mean, you got the Leadership Lab. That's a Facebook group. Who knows what you got going on there? I don't even, do you have any books there? Like, <laughs> you got so much, right? So I love it. I love it. And we're going to end it with this. This is the Well-Centered Woman podcast. And to, to be centered, that means to be balanced, at peace, emotional, and spiritual equilibrium. And that's something that's just dear to my heart. So what is the number one daily practice that you, Takumbo the leader, do to stay centered and sane in your journey? Yeah, the meditation in the morning and having a solid morning routine is important for me. Waking up at a certain time every single day, even if you're tired, like that is something that I have to push myself to do. I have to wake up and sit in silence for 15 minutes, like quiet everything down and definitely get centered on God and then, you know, go into prayer or, and then go into, I have to, there's set days that I read. I study the scriptures. I talk about this on my lives where there's set days that I actually study for a particular time. And it has to happen on, on these particular days so that I can, um, so that I can have peace throughout my entire day. Some, one of the things that I'm doing now, cause every season I change like my morning routines, you know, you change what time you wake up based on the season that you're in. So this season I have to wake up do devotion, meditation, and then I have to go run. That's it. Like, that's how I keep myself. I'm like, if I don't do those things, uh, yesterday I didn't go run because I was like, oh, it's raining. I get a day off. And um, I was so mad the rest of the day because that's the season that I'm in. You have to have solid routines in the morning. That is what helps me praying in the morning and definitely seeking God's face. When I miss that devotional time, oh my gosh, it's not good. So I know how <laughs> I know. I know. I know. I agree wholeheartedly. Same here. Same here. I got to get that in. That is a key principle, a key thing for any woman that calls herself a woman of influence, a lady leader, somebody that's leading other people that builds capacity and it keeps you centered and sane while you're walking out your purpose. So tell us your current projects. What are, what is your latest thing that you are offering right now that, you, that God has you on, that you're opening the doors to, how people can connect with you if they want to learn, learn more and work with you? 
All right. So good question. So we have a new school coming out and we did a, we did one course on it, but like God put it on my heart to definitely do a five week course. So it's called prophetic scribe school. So this is for people that believe that they have a teaching gift, a writing gift and a prophetic gift and how all those gifts work together. So I have my, my new book that's out and actually the audio book is coming out soon. I just reviewed the audio book of this today and that's my first audio book. So this is, our course is based off of this book, right? And so we have a whole school for that for people because I've met a lot of women influencers who have a prophetic gift, they have a teaching gift and a writing gift, but they don't know how to marry all three, right? Because they're a multi-talented woman. So being a prophetic scribe is not only about being a person that knows how to write and hear from the Holy Spirit, but also a person that knows how to teach prophetically. And so there's levels to being a prophetic scribe. So that's our current thing that we're doing at the moment. And we're also doing author school, which is uh, launching in August. And so I have a schedule. So June, we're doing prophetic scribe school. And then in August, we're going into author school, which is where we, so we have transitioned Write Your Book Academy into author school, where we no longer are interested in only you writing the book. We want you to go all the way to publish with TTL Publishing. And so that is the things that we're doing for the remainder of the year. I also have my new journal out and I don't, um, my prototype is actually in my car, but there is, that's my, my first journal, interactive journal, and which I was excited about because we had our Bible study challenge for women. And usually people always ask me, where's my, where's a journal for these challenges? And I never have one. So I'm like, okay, well, I made one this time. And so that is actually years of me practicing what I do. I shared my history with people in that textbook or in that book It's 270 pages. And it's a process of like what I do to study my Bible. And we give you guys space to journal interactively. So it's not a regular journal because I don't know how to do anything regular. I, I have, <laughs> I have she, she kind of pray for me. So that's what's coming up. And I just have other authors, other women authors that we are producing their books. And so that takes up a lot of my time. So if you don't see me on social media in the month of April, that's what I'm doing. And obviously working on pastoring. Uh, so we don't see my face all the time. A lot of work to do. <laughs> amen. 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 Well, it has been a pleasure and an honor to work with you. And I hope those that are listening, take note, take heed. This, she said a lot of meat in this, in this podcast. You said a lot of stuff. So I'm going to have to go back. It's going to be very challenging for me to pick up the right sound bite because you just low key dropped mics. Yes. Okay. Yes. And you can find her at uh, tacumbotheleader.com. And I will have all of her information in the show notes. And of course, you know, you can find this on Apple, Spotify, wherever you, of course, are listening to this. And all of her information will be in the show notes on how to connect with her. So definitely check her out. Visit her website. Follow on her Facebook and Instagram at tacumbotheleader. And we will be back out here again soon. But thank you so much much thank you so much thank you so much for the opportunity this was awesome thank you for your questions they definitely pushed me to think about my own journey and sharing it with other people so thank you for the opportunity to share on this wonderful platform to empower other women as well thank you blessings in abundance to you all and i'll be back out here again soon